Chapter 69 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pat Mathewson, England. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 69. Titty Mouse and Tatty Mouse Titty Mouse and Tatty Mouse both lived in a house. Titty Mouse went to leasing, and Tatty Mouse went to leasing, so they both went to leasing. Titty Mouse leased an ear of corn, and Tatty Mouse leased an ear of corn, so they both leased an ear of corn. Titty Mouse made a pudding, and Tatty Mouse made a pudding, so they both made a pudding and Tatty Mouse put her pudding into the pot to boil. But when Titty went to put hers in, the pot tumbled over and scalded her to death. When Tatty sat down and wept, and a three-legged stool said, Tatty, why do you weep? Titty's dead, said Tatty, and so I weep. Then, said the stool, I'll hop. So the stool hopped. Then a broom in the corner of the room said, Stool, why do you hop? Oh, said the stool, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and so I hop. Then, said the broom, I'll sweep. So the broom began to sweep. Then, said the door, Broom, why do you sweep? Oh, said the broom, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and so I sweep. Then, said the door, I'll jar. So the door jarred. Then, said the window, Door, why do you jar? Oh, said the door, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, and so I jar. Then said the window, I'll creak. So the window creaked. Now there was an old form outside the house, and when the window creaked, the form said, Window, why do you creak? Oh, said the window, Titty's dead. Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, the door jars, and so I creak. Then said the old form, I'll run round the house. Then the old form ran round the house. Now there was a fine, large walnut tree growing by the cottage, and the tree said to the form, Form, why do you run round the house? Oh, said the form, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, the door jars, and the window creaks, and so I run round the house. Then, said the walnut tree, I'll shed my leaves. So the walnut tree shed all its beautiful green leaves. Now there was a little bird perched on one of the boughs of the tree, and when all the leaves fell, it said, Walnut tree, why do you shed your leaves? Oh, said the tree, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, the door jars, and the window creaks. The old form runs round the house, and so I shed my leaves. Then said the little bird, I'll moult all my feathers. So he moulted all his pretty feathers. Now there was a little girl walking below, carrying a jug of milk for her brothers and sisters' supper. And when she saw the poor little bird moult all its feathers, she said, Little bird, why do you moult all your feathers? Oh, said the little bird, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, the door jars, and the window creaks, the old form runs round the house, the walnut tree sheds its leaves, and so I moult all my feathers. Then said the little girl, I'll spill the milk. So she dropped the pitcher and spilt the milk. Now there was an old man just by, on the top of a ladder, thatching a rick. And when he saw the little girl spill the milk, he said, Little girl, what do you mean by spilling the milk? Your little brothers and sisters must go without their supper. Then said the little girl, Titty's dead and Tatty weeps. The stool hops and the broom sweeps. The door jars and the window creaks. The old form runs round the house. The walnut tree sheds all its leaves. The little bird moults all its feathers and so I spill the milk. Oh, said the old man, then I'll tumble off the ladder and break my neck. So he tumbled off the ladder and broke his neck, and when the old man broke his neck, the great walnut tree fell down with a crash, 
and upset the old form and house, and the house falling knocked the window out, and the window knocked the door down, and the door upset the broom, and the broom upset the stool, and poor little Tatty Mouse was buried beneath the ruins. End of chapter 69「Chapter Seventy of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Seventy. The Magpie's Nest. Once upon a time all the birds of the air came to the magpie and asked her to teach them how to build nests for the magpie is the cleverest of all at building. So she put them all around her and began to show them how to do it. First of all, she took some mud and made a sort of round cake with it. Oh, that's how it's done, said the thrush, and away he flew, and so that's how thrushes build their nests. Then the magpie took some twigs and arranged them around the mud. Now I know all about it, said the blackbird, and off he flew, and that's how blackbirds make their nests to this very day. Then the magpie put another layer of mud over the twigs. Oh, that's quite obvious, said the wise owl, and away he flew, and owls have never made better nests since. After this the magpie took some twigs and twined them around the outside. The very thing, said the sparrow, and off he went, so sparrows make rather slovenly nests to this day. Well, then Madge Magpie took some feathers and stuffed and lined the nest very comfortably with it. That suits me, cried the starling, and off he flew, and very comfortable nests have starlings. So it went on, every bird taking away some knowledge of how to build nests, but none of them waiting to the end. Meanwhile, Madge Magpie went on working and working without looking up, till the only bird that remained was the turtle dove, and that hadn't paid any attention all along, but only kept on saying its silly cry, Take two, Taffy, take two, oo at last the magpie heard this, just as she was putting a twig across. So she said, One's enough. But the turtle dove kept on saying, Take two, Taffy, take two. Then the magpie grew angry and said, One's enough, I tell you. Still the turtle dove cried, Take two, Taffy, take two. At last and at last the magpie looked up and saw nobody near her but the silly turtle dove, and then she grew very angry and refused to teach any more. And that is why all the birds build their nests in different ways up to this day. Each one made off, you see, as soon as he thought he had learned the magpie's secret, and each is perfectly contented with his own way. End of chapter 70. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 71 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Scrapefoot. Once upon a time there were three bears who lived in a castle in a great wood. One of them was a great big bear, and one was a middling bear and one was a little bear. And in the same wood there was a fox who lived all alone. His name was Scrapefoot. Scrapefoot was very much afraid of the bears, but for all that he wanted very much to know about them. And one day as he went through the wood he found himself near the bear's castle, and he wondered whether he could get into the castle. He looked all about him everywhere, and he could not see anyone. So he came on very quietly, till at last he came up to the door of the castle and he tried whether he could open it. Yes, the door was not locked, and he opened it just a little way, and put his nose in and looked, and he could not see anyone. So then he opened it a little way farther, and put one paw in, then another paw, and another, and another, and then he was all in the bear's castle. He found he was in a great hall with three chairs in it, one big, one middling, and one little chair and he thought he would like to sit down and rest and look about him. So he sat down on the big chair. But he found it so hard and uncomfortable that it made his bones ache, and he jumped down at once and got into the middling chair, and he turned round and round in it, but he couldn't make himself comfortable. 
So then he went to the little chair and sat down in it, and it was so soft and warm and comfortable that Scrapefoot was quite happy. But all at once it broke into pieces under him, and he couldn't put it together again. So he got up and began to look about him again, and on one table he saw three saucers, of which one was very big, one was middling, and one was quite a little saucer. Scrapefoot was very thirsty, and he began to drink out of the big saucer. But he only just tasted the milk in the big saucer, which was so sour and so horrid that he would not taste another drop of it. Then he tried the middling saucer, and he drank a little of that. He tried two or three mouthfuls, but it was not nice, and then he left it and went to the little saucer, and the milk in the little saucer was so sweet and so nice that he went on drinking it till it was all gone. Then Scrapefoot thought he would like to go upstairs, and he listened and he could not hear anyone. So upstairs he went, and he found a great room with three beds in it. One was a big bed, one was a middling bed, and one was a little white bed and he climbed into the big bed, but it was so hard and lumpy and uncomfortable that he jumped down again at once and tried the middling bed. That was rather better, but he could not lie comfortably in it, so after turning about a little while he got up and went to the little bed, and that was so soft and so warm and so nice that he fell fast asleep at once. And after a time the bears came home. And when they got into the hall, the big bear went to his chair and said, Who's been sitting in my chair? And the middling bear said, Who's been sitting in my chair? And the little bear said, Who's been sitting in my chair and has broken it all to pieces? And then they went to have their milk. And the big bear said, Who's been drinking my milk? And the middling bear said, Who's been drinking my milk? And the little bear said, Who's been drinking my milk and has drunk it all up? Then they went upstairs into the bedroom, and the big bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed? And the middling bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed? And the little bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed? And see, here he is. So then the bears came and wondered what they should do with him, and the big bear said, Let's hang him. And then the middling bear said, Let's drown him. And then the little bear said, Let's throw him out the window. And then the bears took him to the window, and the big bear took two legs on one side, and the middling bear took two legs on the other side, and they swung him backward and forward, backward and forward, and out of the window. Poor Scrapefoot was so frightened, and he thought every bone in his body must be broken. But he got up, and first shook one leg. No, that was not broken. And then another. And that was not broken. And another, and another, and then he wagged his tail and found there were no bones broken. So then he galloped off home as fast as he could go, and never went near the bear's castle again. End of chapter 71「Chapter seventy two Tales of Laughter by Wiggins and Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wise Men of Gotham Of Bind Sheep, there were two men of Gotham, and one of them was going to market to Nottingham to buy sheep, and the other came from the market, and they both met together upon Nottingham Bridge. "'Where are you going?' said the one who came from Nottingham. "'Mary,' said he that was going to Nottingham, "'I am going to buy sheep.' "'Buy sheep?' said the other. "'And which way will you bring them home?' "'Mary,' said the other, "'I will bring them over this bridge.' "'By Robin Hood,' said he that came from Nottingham, "'but thou shalt not.' "'By Maid Marian,' said he that was going thither, "'but I will.' "'You will not,' said the one. "'I will.' "'Then they beat their staves against the ground. 
one against the other as if there'd been a hundred sheep between them. Hold in, said one. Beware, lest my sheep leap over the bridge. I care not, said the other. They shall not come this way. But they shall, said the other. Then the other said, If that thou make much to do, I will put my fingers in thy mouth. Will you? said the other. Now, as they were at their contention, another man of Gotham came from the market with a sack of meal upon a horse, and seeing and hearing his neighbors at strife about sheep, though there were none between them, said, Ah, fools, will you ever learn wisdom? Help me, and lay my sack upon my shoulders. They did so, and he went to the side of the bridge, unloosened the mouth of the sack, and shook all his meal out into the river. Now, neighbors, he said, how much meal is there in my sack? Mary, they said, there is none at all. Now, by my faith, said he, even as much wit as is in your two heads to stir up strife about a thing you have not. Which was the wisest of these three persons? Judge yourself. Of Hedging a Cuckoo Once upon a time, the men of Gotham would have kept the cuckoo, so that she might sing all the year and in the midst of their town they made a hedge round in compass and they got a cuckoo and put her into it and said sing there all through the year or thou shalt have neither meat nor water the cuckoo as soon as she perceived herself within the hedge flew away a vengeance on her said they we did not make our hedge high enough of sending cheeses. There was a man of Gotham who went to the market at Nottingham to sell cheese, and, as he was going down the hill to Nottingham Bridge, one of his cheeses fell out of his wallet and rolled down the hill. Ach, gaffer, said the fellow, can you run into market alone? I will send one after another after you. Then he laid down his wallet and took out the cheeses and rolled them down the hill. Some went into one bush, and some went into another. I charge you all to meet me near the market place, cried he, and when the fellow came to the market to meet his cheeses, he stayed there till the market was nearly done. Then he went about to inquire of his friends and neighbors, and other men, if they did see his cheeses come to the market. Who should bring them? said one of the market men marry themselves said the fellow they know the way well enough he said a vengeance on them all i did fear to see them run so fast that they would run beyond the market and am now fully persuaded that they must now be almost at york whereupon he forthwith hired a horse to ride to york to seek his cheeses where they were not but to this day no man can tell him of his cheeses of drowning eels. When Good Friday came, the men of Gotham cast their heads together what to do with their white herrings, their red herrings, their sprats, and other salt fish. One consulted with the other and agreed that such fish should be cast into their pond, which was in the middle of the town, that they might breed against the next year, and every man that had salt fish left cast them into the pool. I have many white herrings, said one. I have many sprats, said another. I have many red herrings, said the other. I have much salt fish. Let all go into the pond or pool, and we shall fare like lords next year. At the beginning of next year following, the men drew near the pond to have their fish, and there was nothing but a great eel. Ah, said they all, a mischief on this eel, for he has eaten up all our fish. 
what shall we do to him said one to the other kill him said one chop him into pieces said another not so said another let us drown him be it so said all and they went to another pond and cast the eel into the pond lie there and shift for yourself for no help thou shalt have from us and they left the eel to drown of sending rent once on a time the men of gotham had forgotten to pay their landlord one said to the other to-morrow is our pay-day and what shall we find to send our money to our landlord the one said this day i have caught a hare and he shall carry it for he is light of foot be it so said all he shall have a letter and a purse to put our money in and we shall direct him the right way so when the letters were written and the money put in a purse they tied it around the hare's neck saying first you go to lancaster then thou must go to lochborough and newark is our landlord and commend us to him and there is his dues the hare as soon as he was out of their hands ran on along the country way some cried thou must go to lancaster first let the hare alone said another he can tell a nearer way than the best of us all let him go another said it's a subtle hare let her alone she will not keep the highway for fear of dogs of counting on a certain time there were twelve men of gotham who went fishing and some went into the water and some on dry ground and as they were coming back one of them said we have ventured much this day wading i pray god that none of us that did come from home be drowned marry said one let us see about that twelve of us came out and every man did count eleven and the twelfth man never did count himself alas said one to the other one of us is drowned they went back to the brook where they had been fishing and looked up and down for him that was drowned and made great lamentation a courtier came riding by and he did ask what they were seeking and why they were so sorrowful oh said they this day we came to fish in this brook and there were twelve of us and one is drowned why said the courtier count me how many of you there be and one counted eleven and did not count himself well said the courtier what will you give me if i find the twelfth man sir said they all the money we have give me the money said the courtier and he began with the first and gave him a whack over the shoulders that he groaned and said there is one and he served all of them that they groaned but when he came to the last he gave him a good blow saying here is the twelfth man god bless you on your heart said all the company you have found our neighbour End of chapter 72、Chapter、seventy two Chapter 73 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 73 Henny Penny. One day Henny Penny was picking up corn in the cornyard when, whack, something hit her upon the head. Goodness gracious me, said Henny Penny, the skies are going to fall. I must go and tell the king. So she went along and she went along and she went along till she met Cocky Locky. Where are you going, Henny Penny? says Cocky Locky. Oh, I'm going to tell the king the skies are falling, says Henny Penny. May I come with you, says Cocky Locky? Certainly, says Henny Penny. So Henny Penny and Cocky Locky went to tell the king the sky was falling. They went along and they went along and they went along till they met Ducky Daddles. 
"'Where are you going to, Henny Penny and Cocky Locky?' says Ducky Daddles. "'Oh, we're going to tell the king the skies are falling,' says Henny Penny and Cocky Locky. "'May I come with you?' says Ducky Daddles. "'Certainly,' says Henny Penny and Cocky Locky. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles went to tell the king the sky was a-falling. So they went along, and they went along, and they went along, till they met Goosey Pussy. "'Where are you going to, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles?' says Goosey Pussy. "'Oh, we're going to tell the king the sky's a-falling,' says Henny Penny, and Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles. "'May I come with you?' says Goosey Pussy. "'Certainly,' says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Pussy went to tell the king the sky was a-falling. So they went along, and they went along, and they went along, till they met Turkey Lurkey. "'Where are you going, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Pussy?' says Turkey Lurkey. "'Oh, we're going to tell the king the sky's a-falling,' says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Pussy. "'May I come with you, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Pussy?' says Turkey Lurkey. "'Oh, certainly, Turkey Lurkey,' says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Pussy. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey all went to tell the king the sky was a-falling. So they went along, and they went along, and they went along, till they met Foxy Woxy, and Foxy Woxy says to Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey, Where are you going, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey? And Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey says to Foxy Woxy, We're going to tell the king the skies are falling. Oh, but this is not the way to the king, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey, says Foxy Woxy. I know the proper way. Shall I show it you? Oh, certainly, Foxy Woxy, says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, Turkey Lurkey, and Foxy Woxy all went to tell the king the sky was a-falling. So they went along, and they went along, and they went along, till they came to a narrow and dark hole. Now this was the door of Foxy Woxy's cave. But Foxy Woxy says to Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey, This is a short way to the king's palace. You'll soon get there if you follow me. I will go first, and you come after, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey. Why, of course, certainly, without doubt, why not, says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey. So Foxy Woxy went into his cave, and didn't go very far, but turned round to wait for Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Pussy, and Turkey Lurkey. So at last Turkey Lurkey went through the dark hole into the cave. He hadn't got far when, Hoof! Foxy Woxy snapped off Turkey Lurkey's head and threw his body over his left shoulder. Then Goosey Pussy went in and, Hoof! Off went her head, and Goosey Pussy was thrown beside Turkey Lurkey. Then Ducky Daddles waddled down and, Hoof! snapped Foxy Woxy, and Ducky Daddles' head was off, and Ducky Daddles was thrown alongside Turkey Lurkey and Goosey Pussy. Then Cocky Locky strutted down into the cave, and he hadn't gone far when, Snap! Hrumph! went Foxy Woxy, and Cocky Locky was thrown alongside of Turkey Lurkey, Goosey Pussy, and Ducky Daddles. But Foxy Woxy had made two bites at Cocky Locky, and when the first snap only hurt Cocky Locky, but didn't kill him, he called out to Henny Penny. So she turned tail, and off she ran home, and she never told the king the sky was a-falling. End of chapter 73 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 74 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 74 A Son of Adam a man was working one day, 
It was very hot, and he was digging. By and by he stopped to rest and wipe his face, and he grew very angry to think he had to work so hard just because of Adam's sin. So he complained bitterly and said some very hard words about Adam. It happened that his master heard him, and he asked, Why do you blame Adam? Yod had done just like Adam, if you'd a been in his place. No, I shouldn't, says the man. I should a known better. Well, I'll try you, says his master. Come to me at dinner time. So come dinner time, the man came and his master took him into a room where the table was a set with good things of all sorts, and he said, Now you can eat as much as ever you like from any of the dishes on the table, but don't touch the covered dish in the middle till I come back. And with that the master went out of the room and left the man there all by himself. So the man began to taste some of this dish and some of that, and enjoyed himself finely. But after a while, as his master didn't come back, he began to look at the covered dish, and to wonder whatever was in it. And he wondered more and more, and he says to himself, It must be something very nice. Why shouldn't I just look at it? I won't touch it. There can't be any harm in just peeping. So at last he could hold back no longer, and he lifted up the cover a tiny bit, but he couldn't see anything. Then he lifted it up a bit more, and out popped a mouse. The man tried to catch it, but it ran away and jumped off the table, and he ran after it. It ran first into one corner, and then, just as he thought he'd got it, into another, and under the table, and all about the room. And the man made such a clatter, jumping and banging and running round after the mouse, a trying to catch it, that at last his master came in. Ah, he said, never you blame Adam again, my man. End of chapter 74「Chapter 75 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. The Happy Family The largest green leaf in the country is certainly the burdock leaf. If you hold it in front of you, it is large enough for an apron and if you hold it over your head it is almost as good as an umbrella it is so wonderfully large a burdock never grows alone where it grows there are many more and it is a splendid sight and all this splendor is good for snails grand people in olden times used to have the great white snails made into fricassees and when they had eaten them they would say oh what a delicious dish for these people really thought them good such snails lived on burdock leaves and for them the burdock was planted there was once an old estate where no one now lived to require snails indeed the owners had all died out but the burdock still flourished it grew over all the beds and walks of the garden its growth had no check till it became at last quite a forest of burdocks here and there stood an apple or plum tree but for this nobody would have thought the place had ever been a garden it was burdock from one end to the other and here lived the last two surviving snails they knew not themselves how old they were but they could remember the time when there were a great many more of them and that they were descended from a family which came from foreign lands and that the whole forest had been planted for them and theirs 
they had never been away from the garden but they knew that another place once existed in the world called the duke's palace castle in which some of their relations had been boiled till they became black and were then laid on a silver dish but what was done afterward they did not know besides they could not imagine exactly how it felt to be boiled and placed on a silver dish but no doubt it was something very fine and highly genteel neither the cockchafer nor the toad nor the earthworm whom they questioned about it could give them the least information for none of their relations had ever been cooked or served on a silver dish the old white snails were the most aristocratic race in the world they knew that the forest had been planted for them and the nobleman's castle had been built solely that they might be cooked and laid on silver dishes they lived quite retired and very happily and as they had no children of their own they had adopted a little common snail which they brought up as their own child the little one would not grow for he was only a common snail but the old people particularly the mother snail declared that she could easily see how he grew and when the father said he could not perceive it she begged him to feel the little snail's shell and he did so and found that the mother was right one day it rained very fast listen when a drumming there is on the burdock leaves tum 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 said the father snail there come the drops said the mother they are trickling down the stalks we shall have it very wet here presently i am very glad we have such good houses and that the little one has one of his own there has been really more done for us than for any other creature it is quite plain that we are the most noble people in the world we have houses from our birth and the burdock forest has been planted for us i should very much like to know how far it extends and what lies beyond it there can be nothing better than we have here said the father snail i wish for nothing more yes but i do said the mother i should like to be taken to the palace and boiled and laid upon a silver dish as was done to all our ancestors and you may be sure it must be something very uncommon the nobleman's castle perhaps has fallen to decay said the snail father or the burdock wood may have grown over it so that those who live there cannot get out you need not be in a hurry you are always so impatient and the youngster is getting just the same he has been three days creeping to the top of that stalk i feel quite giddy when i look at him you must not scold him said the mother snail he creeps so very carefully he will be the joy of our home and we old folks have nothing else to live for but have you ever thought where we are to get a wife for him do you think that farther out in the wood there may be others of our race there may be black snails no doubt said the old snail black snails without houses though they are vulgar and conceited too but we can give the ants a commission they run here and there as if they all had much business to get through they most likely will know of a wife for our youngster i certainly know a most beautiful bride said one of the ants but i fear it would not do for she is a queen that does not matter said the old snail has she a house she has a palace replied the ant a most beautiful ant palace with seven hundred passages thank you said the mother snail but our boy shall not go to live in an ant hill if you know of nothing better 
we will give the commission to the white gnats they fly about in rain and sunshine they know the burdock wood from one end to the other we have a wife for him said the gnats a hundred man steps from here there is a little snail with a house sitting on a gooseberry bush she is quite alone and old enough to be married it is only a hundred man steps from here then let her come to him said the old people he has the whole burdock forest she has only a bush so they brought the little lady snail she took eight days to perform the journey but that was just as it ought to be for it showed her to be one of the right breeding and then they had a wedding six glowworms gave as much light as they could but in other respects it was all very quiet for the old snails could not bear festivities or a crowd but a beautiful speech was made by the mother snail the father could not speak he was too much overcome then they gave the whole burdock forest to the young snails as an inheritance and repeated what they had so often said that it was the finest place in the world and that if they led upright and honorable lives and their family increased they and their children might some day be taken to the nobleman's palace to be boiled black and laid on a silver dish and when they had finished speaking the old couple crept into their houses and came out no more for they slept the young snail pair now ruled in the forest and had numerous prodigy but as the young ones were never boiled or laid in silver dishes they concluded that the castle had fallen into decay and that all the people in the world were dead and as nobody contradicted them they thought they might be right and the rain fell upon the burdock leaves to play the drum for them and the sun shone to paint colors on the burdock forest for them and they were very happy the whole family was entirely and perfectly happy hans christian anderson end of chapter seventy five Recording by Linda Bree Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 76 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggins The Blind Man, the Deaf Man, and the Donkey A blind man and a deaf man once entered into a partnership. The deaf man was to see for the blind man, and the blind man was to hear for the deaf man one day both went to a notch together the deaf man said the dancing is very good but the music is not worth listening to and the blind man said on the contrary i think the music is very good but the dancing is not worth looking at musical and dancing entertainment after this day they went together for a walk in the jungle and there found a dobie's donkey that had strayed away from its owner and a great big chatty such as a dobie's boil clothes in which the donkey was carrying with him the deaf man said to the blind man brother here are a donkey and a dobie's great big chatty with nobody to own them let us take them with us they may be useful to us some day very well said the blind man we will take them with us so the blind man and the deaf man went on their way
taking the donkey and the great big chatty with them. A little farther on they came to an ant's nest, and the deaf man said to the blind man, Here are a number of very fine black ants, much larger than I ever saw before. Let us take some of them home to show our friends. Very well, answered the blind man. We will take them as a present to our friends. So the deaf man took a silver snuff-box out of his pocket and put four or five of the finest black ants into it, which done, they continued their journey. But before they had gone very far, a terrible storm came on. It thundered and lightened and rained and blew with such a fury that it seemed as if the whole heavens and earth were at war. Oh dear, oh dear, cried the deaf man, how dreadful this lightning is. Let us make haste and get to some place of shelter. I don't see that it's dreadful at all, answered the blind man, but the thunder is very terrible. We had better certainly seek some place of shelter. Now, not far off was a lofty building, which looked exactly like a fine temple. The deaf man saw it, and he and the blind man resolved to spend the night there, and having reached the place, they went in and shut the door, taking the donkey and the great big chatty with them. But this building, which they mistook for a temple, was in truth no temple at all, but the house of a very powerful Rashkas, and hardly had the blind man, the deaf man, and the donkey got inside and fastened the door, than the Rashkas, who had been out, returned home. To his surprise he found the door fastened and heard people moving about inside his house. Ho, ho, cried he to himself some men have got in here have they i'll soon make mincemeat of them so he began to roar in a voice louder than the thunder and to cry let me into my house this minute you wretches let me in let me in i say and to kick the door and batter it with great fists but though his voice was very powerful his appearance was still more alarming, insomuch that the deaf man, who was peeping at him through a chink in the wall, felt so frightened that he did not know what to do. But the blind man was very brave, because he couldn't see, and went up to the door and called out, Who are you, and what do you mean by coming battering at the door in this way, and at this time of night a kind of ogre i'm a rashkas answered the rashkas angrily and this is my house let me in this instant or i'll kill you all this time the deaf man who was watching the rashkas was shivering and shaking in a terrible fright but the blind man was very brave because he couldn't see and he called out again, Oh, you're a Rashkas, are you? Well, if you're Rashkas, I'm Baskus, and Baskus is as good as Rashkas. Baskus, roared the Rashkas. Baskus, Baskus, what nonsense is this? There is no such creature as a Baskus. Go away, replied the blind man and don't dare to make any further disturbance lest i punish you with a vengeance for know that i'm baskus and baskus is rashkus father my father answered rashkus heavens and earth baskus and my father i never heard such an extraordinary thing in my life you my father and in there I never knew my father was called Bashkus. Yes, replied the blind man. Go away instantly, I command you, for I am your father Bashkus. Very well, 
answered rashkas for he began to get puzzled and frightened but if you are my father let me first see your face for he thought perhaps they are deceiving me the blind man and the deaf man didn't know what to do but at last they opened the door a very tiny chink and poked the donkey's nose out when the rashkas saw it he thought to himself bless me what a terrible ugly face my father bashkas has he then called out o oh, father bashkas you have a very big fierce face but people have sometimes very big heads and very little bodies pray let me see your body as well as head before i go away then the blind man and the deaf man rolled the great big dobies chatty with a thundering noise past the chink in the door and the rashkas who was watching attentively was very much surprised when he saw this great black thing rolling along the floor and he thought in truth my father bashkas has a very big body as well as a big head he's big enough to eat me up altogether i'd better go away but still he could not help being a little doubtful so he cried o oh, bashkas father bashkas you have indeed got a very big head and a very big body but do before i go away let me hear you scream for all rashkas scream fearfully then the cunning deaf man who was getting less frightened pulled the silver snuff-box out of his pocket and took the black ants out of it and put one black ant in the donkey's right ear and another black ant in the donkey's left ear and another and another the ants pinched the poor donkey's ears dreadfully and the donkey was so hurt and frightened he began to bellow as loud as he could eaw 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 ah ah at this terrible noise the rashkas fled away in a great fright saying enough enough father bashkas the sound of your voice would make the most refractory obedient and no sooner had he gone than the deaf man took the ants out of the donkey's ears and he and the blind man spent the rest of the night in peace and comfort next morning the deaf man woke the blind man early saying awake brother awake here we are indeed in luck the whole floor is covered with heaps of gold and silver and precious stones and so it was for the rashkas owned a vast amount of treasure and the whole house was full of it that is a good thing said the blind man show me where it is and i will help you collect it so they collected as much treasure as possible and made four great bundles of it the blind man took one great bundle the deaf man took another and putting the other two great bundles on the donkey they started off to return home but the rashkas whom they had frightened away the night before had not gone very far off and was waiting to see what his father bashkas might look like by daylight he saw the door of his house open and watch attentively when walked out only a blind man a deaf man and a donkey who were all three laden with large bundles of his treasure the blind man carried one bundle the deaf man carried another bundle and two bundles were on the donkey the rashkas was extremely angry and immediately called six of his friends to help him kill the blind man the deaf man and the donkey and recover the treasure the deaf man saw them coming seven great rashkas with hair a yard long and tusks like an elephant's and was dreadfully frightened but the blind man was very brave because he couldn't see and said brother why do you lag behind in that way 
oh answered the deaf man there are seven great rashkas with tusks like an elephant's coming to kill us what can we do let us hide the treasure in the bushes said the blind man and do you lead me to a tree then i will climb up first and you shall climb up afterward and so we shall be out of their way the deaf man thought this good advice so he pushed the donkey and the bundles of the treasure into the bushes and led the blind man to a high sopari tree that grew close by but he was a very cunning man this deaf man and instead of letting the blind man climb up first and following him he got up first and let the blind man clamber after so that he was farther out of harm's way than his friend when the rashkas arrived at the place and saw them both perched out of reach in the sopari tree he said to his friends let us get on each other's shoulders we shall then be high enough to pull them down so one rashka stooped down and the second got on his shoulders and the third on his and the fourth on his and the fifth on his and the sixth on his and the seventh and the last rashkas who had invited all the others was just climbing up when the deaf man who was looking over the blind man's shoulder got so frightened that in his alarm he caught hold of his friend's arm crying they're coming they're coming the blind man was not in a very secure position and was sitting at his ease and not knowing how close the rashkas were the consequence was that when the deaf man gave him this unexpected push he lost his balance and tumbled down on to the neck of the seventh rashkas who was just then climbing up the blind man had no idea where he was but thought he had got to on to the branch of some other tree and stretching out his hand for something to catch hold of caught hold of the rashkas two great ears and pinched them very hard in his surprise and fright the rashkas couldn't think what it was that had come trembling down upon him and the weight of the blind man upsetting his balance down he also fell to the ground knocking down in their turn the sixth fifth fourth third second and first rashkas who all rolled one over another and lay in a confused heap at the foot of the tree together meanwhile the blind man called out to his friend where am i what has happened where am i where am i the deaf man who was safe up in the tree answered well done brother never fear never fear you're all right only hold tight i'm coming down to help you but he had not the least intention of leaving his place of safety however he continued to call out never mind brother hold on as tight as you can i'm coming i'm coming and the more he called out the harder the blind man pinched the rashka's ears which he mistook for some kind of palm branches the six other rashkas who had succeeded after a good deal of kicking in extricating themselves from their unpleasant position thought they had quite enough of helping their friend and ran away as fast as they could and the seventh thinking from their going that the danger must be greater than he imagined and being moreover very much afraid of the mysterious creature that sat on his shoulders put his hands to the back of his ears and pushed off the blind man and then without staying to see who or what it was followed his six companions as fast as he could as soon as all the rashkas were out of sight the deaf man came down from the tree and picking up the blind man embraced him saying i could not have done better myself you have frightened away all our enemies but you see i came to help you as fast as possible 
then he dragged the donkey and the bundles of treasure out of the bushes gave the blind man one bundle to carry took the second himself and put the remaining two on the donkey as before this done the whole party set off to return home but when they had got nearly out of the jungle the deaf man said to the blind man we are now close to the village but if we take all this treasure home with us we shall run great risk of being robbed i think our best plan would be to divide it equally then you can take care of your half and i will take care of mine and each one can hide his share here in the jungle or wherever pleases him best very well said the blind man do you divide what we have in the bundles into two equal portions keeping one half yourself and giving me the other the cunning deaf man however had no intention of giving up half the treasure to the blind man so he first took his own bundle of treasure and hid it in the bushes and then he took the two bundles off the donkey and hid them in the bushes and he took a good deal of treasure out of the blind man's bundle which he also hid then taking the small quantity that remained he divided it into two equal portions and placing half before the blind man and half in front of himself said their brother is your share to do what you please with the blind man put out his hand but when he felt what was a very little heap of treasure it was he got very angry and cried this is not fair you are deceiving me you have kept almost all the treasure for yourself and only given me a very little oh no how can you think so answered the deaf man but if you will not believe me feel for yourself see my heap of treasure is no larger than yours the blind man put out his hands again to feel how much his friend had kept but in front of the deaf man lay only a very small heap no larger than what he had himself received at this he got very cross and said come come this won't do you think you can cheat me in this way because i am blind but i'm not so stupid as all that i carried a great bundle of treasure you carried a great bundle of treasure and there were two great bundles on the donkey do you mean to pretend that all that made no more treasure than these two little heaps no indeed i know better than that stuff and nonsense answered the deaf man stuff or no stuff continued the other you are trying to take me in and i won't be taken in by you no i'm not said the deaf man yes you are said the blind man and so they went on bickering scolding growling contradicting until the blind man got so enraged that he gave the deaf man a tremendous box on the ear the blow was so violent that it made the deaf man hear the deaf man very angry gave his neighbor in return so hard a blow in the face that it opened the blind man's eyes so the deaf man could hear as well as see and the blind man could see as well as hear this astonished them both so much that they became good friends at once the deaf man confessed to having hidden the bulk of the treasure which he thereupon dragged forth from its place of concealment and having divided it equally they went home and enjoyed themselves End of chapter 76 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter seventy seven of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate 
Douglas Wiggum. The Alligator and the Jackal A hungry jackal once went down to the riverside in search of little crabs, bits of fish, and whatever else he could find for his dinner. Now it chanced that in this river there lived a great big alligator, who, being also very hungry, would have been extremely glad to eat the jackal. The jackal ran up and down, here and there, but for a long time could find nothing to eat. At last, close to where the alligator was lying among some tall bulrushes under the clear, shallow water, he saw a little crab sidling along as fast as his legs could carry him. The jackal was so hungry that when he saw this, he poked his paw into the water to try and catch the crab. When snap, the old alligator caught hold of him. Oh dear, thought the jackal to himself, what can I do? This great big alligator has caught my paw in his mouth, and in another minute he will drag me down by it under the water and kill me. My only chance is to make him think he has made a mistake. So he called out in a cheerful voice, Clever alligator, clever alligator, to catch hold of a bulrush root instead of my paw. I hope you find it very tender. The alligator, who was so buried among the bulrushes that he could hardly see, thought, on hearing this, Dear me, how tiresome! I fancied I had caught hold of the jackal's paw, but there he is, calling out in a cheerful voice. I suppose I must have seized a bulrush root instead, as he says, and he let the jackal go. The jackal ran away as fast as he could, crying, Oh, wise alligator, wise alligator, so you let me go again. Then the alligator was very much vexed but the jackal had run away too far to be caught. Next day the jackal returned to the riverside to get his dinner as before, but because he was very much afraid of the alligator, he called out, Whenever I go to look for my dinner, I see the nice little crabs peeping up through the mud. Then I catch them and eat them. I wish I could see one now. The alligator, who was buried in the mud at the bottom of the river, heard every word, so he popped the little point of his snout above it, thinking, If I do but just show the tip of my nose, the jackal will take me for a crab and put in his paw to catch me, and as soon as ever he does, I'll gobble him up. But no sooner did the jackal see the little tip of the alligator's nose than he called out, Ah, my friend, there you are. No dinner for me in this part of the river then, I think. And so saying, he ran farther on and fished for his dinner a long way from that place. The alligator was very angry at missing his prey a second time and determined not to let him escape again. So on the following day, when the little tormentor returned to the waterside, the alligator hid himself close to the bank, in order to catch him if he could. Now the jackal was rather afraid of going near the river, for he thought, Perhaps the alligator will catch me today. But yet, being hungry, he did not wish to go without his dinner. So to make all as safe as he could, he cried, where are all the little crabs gone there is not one here and i am so hungry and generally even when they are under water one can see them going bubble 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 and all the little bubbles go pop 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 on hearing this the alligator who was buried in the mud under the river bank thought i will pretend to be a little crab and he began to blow, puff, 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 bubble, 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 and all the great bubbles rushed to the surface of the river and burst there, and the waters eddied round and round like a whirlpool, and there was such a commotion when the huge monster began to blow bubbles 
in this way that the jackal saw very well who must be there and he ran away as fast as he could saying thank you kind alligator thank you thank you indeed i would not have come here had i known you were so close this enraged the alligator extremely it made him quite cross to think of being so often deceived by a little jackal and he said to himself i will be taken in no more next time i will be very cunning so for a long time he waited and waited for the jackal to return to the riverside but the jackal did not come for he had thought to himself if matters go on in this way i shall some day be caught and eaten by the wicked old alligator i had better content myself with living on wild figs and he went no more near the river but stayed in the jungles and ate wild figs and roots which he dug up with his paws when the alligator found this out he determined to try and catch the jackal on land so going under the largest of the wild fig trees where the ground was covered with the fallen fruit he collected a quantity of it together and burying himself under the great heap waited for the jackal to appear but no sooner did the cunning little animal see this great heap of wild figs all collected together than he thought that looks very like my friend the alligator and to discover if it were so or not he called out this juicy little wild figs i love to eat always tumble down from the tree and roll here and there as the wind dries them but this great heap of figs is quite still these cannot be good figs i will not eat any of them ho ho thought the alligator is that all how suspicious this jackal is i will make the figs roll about a little then and when he sees that he will doubtless come and eat them so the great beast shook himself and all the heap of little figs went roll 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 some a mile this way some a mile that farther than they had ever rolled before or than the most blustering wind could have driven them seeing this the jackal scampered away saying i am so much obliged to you alligator for letting me know you are there for indeed i should have hardly guessed it you were so buried under that heap of figs the alligator hearing this was so angry that he ran after the jackal but the latter ran very very fast away too quickly to be caught then the alligator said to himself i will not allow that little wretch to make fun of me another time and then run away out of reach i will show him that i can be more cunning than he fancies and early the next morning he crawled as fast as he could to the jackal's den which was a hole in the side of a hill and crept into it and hid himself waiting for the jackal who was out to return home but when the jackal got near the place he looked about him and thought dear me the ground looks as if some heavy creature had been walking over it and here are great clods of earth knocked down from each side of the door of my den as if a very big animal had been trying to squeeze himself through it i certainly will not go inside until i know that all is safe there so he called out little house pretty house my sweet little house why do you not give an answer when i call and all is safe and right you always call out to me is anything wrong that you do not speak then the alligator who was inside thought if that is the case i'd better call out that he may fancy all is right in his house and in as gentle a voice as he could he said sweet little jackal at hearing these words the jackal felt quite frightened and thought to himself so the dreadful old alligator is there 
I must try to kill him if I can, for if I do not he will certainly catch and kill me some day. He therefore answered, Thank you, my dear little house. I'd like to hear your pretty voice. I'm coming in in a minute, but first I must collect firewood to cook my dinner. And he ran as fast as he could and dragged all the dry branches and bits of stick he could find close up to the mouth of the den. Meanwhile, the alligator inside kept as quiet as a mouse, but he could not help laughing a little to himself as he thought, so I have deceived this tiresome little jackal at last. In a few minutes he will run in here, and then won't I snap him up? When the jackal had gathered together all the sticks he could find and put them round the mouth of his den, he set them on fire and pushed them as far into it as possible. There was such a quantity of them that they soon blazed up into a great fire, and the smoke and flames filled the den and smothered the wicked old alligator and burned him to death, while the little jackal ran up and down outside dancing for joy and singing. How do you like my house, my friend? Is it nice and warm? Ding dong, ding dong, the alligator is dying. Ding dong, ding dong, he will trouble me no more. I have defeated my enemy. Ring a ting, ding a ting, ding ding dong. End of chapter 77 Recording by Linda Ray Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 78 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. Why the Fish laughed as a certain fisherwoman passed by a palace crying her fish the queen appeared at one of the windows and beckoned her to come near and show what she had at that moment a very big fish jumped about in the bottom of the basket is it a he or a she inquired the queen i wish to purchase a she fish on hearing this the fish laughed out loud it is a he replied the fisherwoman and proceeded on her rounds the queen returned to her room in a great rage and on coming to see her in the evening the king noticed that something had disturbed her are you indisposed he said no but i am very much annoyed at the strange behavior of a fish a woman brought me one to-day, and on my inquiring whether it was a male or female, the fish laughed most rudely. A fish laugh? Impossible! You must be dreaming. I am not a fool. I speak of what I have seen with my own eyes, and have heard with my own ears. Passing strange, be it so, I will inquire concerning it on the morrow the king repeated to his vizier what his wife had told him and bade him investigate the matter and be ready with a satisfactory answer within six months on pain of death the vizier promised to do his best though he felt almost certain of failure for five months he labored infatigably to find a reason for the laughter of the fish he sought everywhere and from every one the wise and the learned and they who were skilled in magic and in all manner of trickery were consulted nobody however could explain the matter and so he returned broken-hearted to his house and began to arrange his affairs in prospect of certain death 
for he had sufficient experience of the king to know that his majesty would not go back from his threat among other things he advised his son to travel for a time until the king's anger should have somewhat cooled the young fellow who was both clever and handsome started off whithersoever kismet may lead him he had been gone some days when he fell in with an old farmer who also was on a journey to a certain village finding the old man very pleasant he asked him if he might accompany him professing to be on a visit to the same place the old farmer agreed and they walked along together the day was hot and the way was long and weary don't you think it would be pleasanter if you and i sometimes gave each other a lift said the youth what a fool this man is thought the old farmer presently they passed through a field of corn ready for the sickle and looking like a sea of gold as it waved to and fro in the breeze is this eaten or not said the young man not understanding his meaning the old man replied i don't know after a little while the two travelers arrived at a big village where the young man gave his companion a clasp knife and said take this friend and get two horses with it but mind and bring it back for it is very precious the old man looking half amused and half angry pushed back the knife muttering something to the effect that his friend was either a fool himself or else trying to play the fool with him the young man pretended not to notice his reply and remained almost silent till they reached the city a short distance outside which was the old farmer's house they walked about the bazaar and went to the mosque but nobody saluted them or invited them to come in and rest what a large cemetery exclaimed the young man what does the man mean thought the old farmer calling this largely populated city a cemetery on leaving the city their way led through a graveyard where a few people were praying beside a tomb and distributing chaptis and kulchas to passers-by in the name of their beloved dead they beckoned to the two travelers and gave them as much as they would what a splendid city this is said the young man now the man must surely be demented thought the old farmer i wonder what he will do next he will be calling the land water and the water land and be speaking of light where there is darkness and of darkness when it is light however he kept his thoughts to himself presently they had to wade through a stream that ran along the edge of the cemetery the water was rather deep so the old farmer took off his shoes and pajamas and crossed over but the young man waded through it with his shoes and pajamas on well i never did see such a perfect fool both in word and in deed said the old man to himself however he liked the fellow and thinking that he would amuse his wife and daughter he invited him to come and stay at his house as long as he had occasion to remain in the village thank you very much the young man replied but let me first inquire if you please whether the beam of your house is strong the old farmer left him in despair and entered his house laughing there's a man in yonder field he said after returning their greetings he has come the greater part of the way with me and i wanted him to put up here as long as he had to stay in this village but the fellow is such a fool that i cannot make anything out of him 
he wants to know if the beam of this house is all right the man must be mad and saying this he burst into a fit of laughter father said the farmer's daughter who was a very sharp and wise girl this man whosoever he is is no fool as you deem him he only wishes to know if you can afford to entertain him oh of course replied the farmer i see well perhaps you can help me to solve some of these other mysteries while we were walking together he asked whether he should carry me or i should carry him as he thought that would be pleasanter mode of proceeding most assuredly said the girl he meant that one of you should tell a story to beguile the time oh yes well we were passing through a cornfield when he asked me whether it was eaten or not and didn't you know the meaning of this father he simply wished to know if the man was in debt or not because if the owner of the field was in debt then the produce of the field was as good as eaten to him that is it would have to go to his creditors yes 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 of course then on entering a certain village he bade me to take his clasp knife and get two horses with it and bring back the knife again to him are not two stout sticks as good as two horses for helping one along on the road he only asked you to cut a couple of sticks and be careful not to lose his knife i see said the farmer while we were walking over the city we did not see anybody that we knew and not a soul gave us a scrap of anything to eat till we were passing the cemetery but there some people called to us and put into our hands some chapatis and kulchas so my companion called the city a cemetery and the cemetery a city this also is to be understood father if one thinks of the city as a place where everything is to be obtained and of inhospitable people as worse than the dead the city though crowded with people was as if dead as far as you were concerned while in the cemetery which is crowded with the dead you were saluted by kind friends and provided with bread true true said the astonished farmer then just now when we were crossing the stream he waded through it without taking off his shoes and pajamas i admire his wisdom replied the girl i have often thought how stupid people were to venture into that swiftly flowing stream and over those sharp stones with bare feet the slightest stumble and they would fall and be wetted from head to foot this friend of yours is a most wise man i should like to see him and speak to him very well said the farmer i will go and find him and bring him in tell him father that our beams are strong enough and then he will come in i'll send on ahead a present to the man to show him that we can afford to have him for our guest accordingly she called a servant and sent him to the young man with a present of a basin of ghee twelve chapatis and a jar of milk and the following message o oh friend the moon is full twelve months make a year and the sea is overflowing with water halfway the bearer of this present and message met his little son who seeing what was in the basket begged his father to give him some of the food his father foolishly complied presently he saw the young man 
and gave him the rest of the present and the message give your mistress my salam he replied and tell her that the moon is new and that i can find only eleven months in the year and the sea is by no means full not understanding the meaning of these words the servant repeated them word for word as he had heard them to his mistress and thus his theft was discovered and he was severely punished after a little while the young man appeared with the old farmer great attention was shown to him and he was treated in every way as if he were the son of a great man although his humble host knew nothing of his origin at length he told them everything about the laughing of the fish his father's threatened execution and his own banishment and asked their advice as to what he should do the laughing of the fish said the girl which seems to have been the cause of all this trouble indicates that there is a man in the palace who is plotting against the king's life joy joy exclaimed the vizier's son there is yet time for me to return and save my father from an ignominious and unjust death and the king from danger the following day he hastened back to his own country taking with him the farmer's daughter immediately on arrival he ran to the palace and informed his father of what he had heard the poor vizier now almost dead from the expectation of death was at once carried to the king to whom he repeated the news that his son had just brought never said the king but it must be so your majesty replied the vizier and in order to prove the truth of what i have heard i pray you call together all the maids in your palace and order them to jump over a pit which must be dug we'll soon find out whether there is any man there the king had the pit dug and commanded all the maids belonging to the palace to dry jump it all of them tried but only one succeeded that one was found to be a man thus was the queen satisfied and the faithful old vizier saved afterward as soon as could be the vizier's son married the old farmer's daughter and a most happy marriage it was end of chapter seventy eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter seventy nine of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin the selfish sparrow and the houseless crows a sparrow once built a nice little house for herself and lined it well with wool and protected it with sticks so that it resisted equally the summer sun and the winter rains a crow who lived close by had also built a house but it was not such a good one being only made of a few sticks laid one above another on the top of a prickly pear hedge the consequence was that one day when there was an unusually heavy shower the crow's nest was washed away while the sparrow's was not at all injured in this extremity the crow and her mate went to the sparrow and said sparrow sparrow have pity on us and give us shelter for the wind blows and the rain beats and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes but the sparrow answered i'm cooking the dinner and cannot let you in now come again presently 
in a little while the crows returned and said sparrow sparrow have pity on us and give us shelter for the wind blows and the rain beats and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes the sparrow answered i'm eating my dinner i cannot let you in now come again presently the crows flew away but in a little while returned and cried once more sparrow sparrow have pity on us and give us shelter for the wind blows and the rain beats and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes the sparrow replied i'm washing the dishes i cannot let you in now come again presently the crows waited a while and then called out sparrow sparrow have pity on us and give us shelter for the wind blows and the rain beats and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes but the sparrow would not let them in she only answered i'm sweeping the floor i cannot let you in now come again presently next time the crows came and cried sparrow sparrow have pity on us and give us shelter for the wind blows and the rain beats and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into her eyes she answered i'm making the beds i cannot let you in now come again presently so on one pretense or another she refused to help out the poor birds at last when she and her children had had their dinner and she had prepared and put away the dinner for the next day and put all the children to bed and gone to bed herself she cried to the crows you may come in now and take shelter for the night the crows came in but they were much vexed at having been kept out so long in the wind and the rain and when the sparrow and all her family were asleep the one said to the other the selfish sparrow had no pity on us she gave us no dinner and would not let us in till she and all her children were comfortably in bed let us punish her so the two crows took all the nice dinner the sparrow had prepared for herself and her children to eat the next day and flew away with it end of chapter 79 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 80 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin the lambkin once upon a time there was a wee wee lambkin who frolicked about on his little tottery legs and enjoyed himself amazingly now one day he set off to visit his granny and was jumping with joy to think of all the good things he should get from her when whom should he meet but a jackal who looked at the tender young morsel and said lambkin lambkin i'll eat you but lambkin only gave a little frisk and said to granny's house i go where i shall fatter grow then you can eat me so the jackal thought this reasonable and let lambkin pass by and by he met a vulture and the vulture looking hungrily at the tender morsel before him said lambkin lambkin i'll eat you but lambkin only gave a little frisk and said to granny's house i go where i shall fatter grow then you can eat me so the vulture thought this reasonable and let lambkin pass and by and by he met a tiger and then a wolf and a dog and an eagle and all these when they saw the tender little morsel said lambkin lambkin i'll eat you but to all of them lambkin replied with a little frisk to granny's house i go where i shall fatter grow then you can eat me so at last he reached his granny's house and said all in a hurry granny dear i've promised to get very fat so as people ought to keep their promises please put me into the corn bin at once so his granny said he was a good boy and put him into the corn bin 
and there the greedy little lambkin stayed for seven days and ate and ate and ate until he could scarcely waddle and his granny said he was fat enough for anything and must go home but cunning little lambkin said that would never do for some animal would be sure to eat him on the way back he was so plump and tender i'll tell you what you must do said master lambkin you must make a little drumkin out of the skin of my little brother who died and then i can sit inside and trundle along nicely for i am as tight as a drum myself so his granny made a little nice drumkin out of his brother's skin with the wool inside and lambkin curled himself up snug and warm in the middle and trundled away gaily soon he met the eagle who called out drumkin drumkin have you seen lambkin and mr lambkin curled up in his soft warm nest replied fallen into the fire and so will you on little drumkin turn pa turn to how very annoying sighed the eagle thinking regretfully of the tender morsel he had let slip meanwhile lambkin trumbled along laughing to himself and singing tum pa tum to tum pa tum to every animal and bird he met asked the same question drumkin drumkin have you seen lambkin and to each of them the little sly boots replied fallen into the fire and so will you on little drumkin turn pa turn to tum pa tum to tum pa tum to then then they all sighed to think of the tender little morsel they had let slip at last the jackal came limping along for all his sorry looks as sharp as a needle and he too called out drumkin drumkin have you seen lambkin and lambkin curled up in his snug little nest replied gaily fallen into the fire and so will you on little drumkin turn pa but he never got any further for the jackal recognized his voice at once and cried hello you've turned yourself inside out have you just you come out of that whereupon he tore open drumkin and gobbled up lambkin end of chapter eighty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter eighty one of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse. Once upon a time, a town mouse met a country mouse on the outskirts of a wood. The country mouse was sitting under a hazel thicket, plucking nuts. "'Busy harvesting, I see,' said the town mouse. "'Who would think of our meeting in this out-of-the-way part of the world?' "'Just so,' said the country mouse. "'You are gathering nuts for your winter store,' said the town mouse. "'I am obliged to do so if we intend having anything to live upon during the winter,' said the country mouse. The husk is big and the nut full this year, enough to satisfy any hungry body," said the town mouse. "'Yes, you are right there,' said the country mouse, and then she related how well she lived and how comfortable she was at home. The town mouse maintained that she was the better off, but the country mouse said that nowhere could one be so well off as in the woods and hills. The town mouse, however, declared she was best off, and as they could not agree on this point, they promised to visit each other at Christmas, and then they could see for themselves which was really the more comfortable. The first visit was to be paid by the town mouse. Now, although the country mouse had moved down from the mountains for the winter, the road to her house was long and tiring, and one had to travel up hill and down dale, the snow lay thick and deep. So the town mouse found it hard work to get on, and she became both tired and hungry before she reached the end of her journey. How nice it will be to get some food, she thought. The country mouse had scraped together the best she had. There were nut kernels, poly potty, and other sorts of roots, 
and many other good things which grow in woods and fields. She kept it all in a hole far underground, so the frost could not reach it, and close by was a running spring, open all the winter, so she could drink as much water as she liked. There was an abundance of all she had, and they ate both well and heartily, but the town mouse thought it was very poor fare indeed. "'One can, of course, keep body and soul together on this,' said she, "'but I don't think much of it. Now you must be good enough to visit me and taste what we have.' Yes, that her hostess would, and before long she set out. The town mouse had gathered together all the scraps from the Christmas fair which the woman of the house had dropped on the floor during the holiday. Bits of cheese, butter, and tallow ends, cake crumbs, pastry, and many other good things. In the dish under the ale tap she had drink enough. In fact, the place was full of all kinds of dainties. They ate and fared well. The country mouse seemed never to have enough. She had never tasted such delicacies. But then she became thirsty, for she found the food both strong and rich, and now she wanted something to drink. "'We haven't far to go for the beer we shall drink,' said the town mouse, and jumped upon the edge of the dish and drank till she was no longer thirsty. She did not drink too much, for she knew the Christmas beer was strong. The country mouse, however, thought the beer a splendid drink. She had never tasted anything but water. So she took one sip after another, but as she could not stand strong drink, she became dizzy before she left the dish. The drink got into her head and down into her toes, and she began running and jumping about from one beer barrel to the other, and to dance and tumble about on the shelves among the cups and mugs. She squeaked and squealed as if she were intoxicated. "'You must not carry on as if you had just come from the back woods and make such a row and noise.' said the town mouse. The master of the house is a bailiff, and he is very strict indeed, she said. The country mouse said she didn't care either for bailiffs or beggars. But the cat sat at the top of the cellar steps, lying in wait, and heard all the chatter and noise. When the woman of the house went down to draw some beer and lifted the trap door, the cat slipped by into the cellar and struck its claws into the country mouse. Then there was quite another sort of dance. The town mouse slid back into her hole and sat in safety looking on, while the country mouse suddenly became sober when she felt the claws of the cat in her back. "'Oh, my dear bailiff, dearest bailiff, be merciful and spare my life, and I will tell you a fairy tale,' she said. "'Well, go on,' said the cat. "'Once upon a time there were two little mice,' said the country mouse squeaking slowly and pitifully, for she wanted to make the story last as long as she could. "'Then they were not lonely,' said the cat dryly and curtly. "'And they had a steak, which they were going to fry.' "'Then they could not starve,' said the cat. "'And they put it out on the roof to cool,' said the country mouse. "'Then they did not burn themselves,' said the cat." "'But there came a fox and a crow and ate it all up,' said the country mouse. "'Then I'll eat you,' said the cat. But just at that moment the woman shut the trap-door with a slam, which so startled the cat that she let go her hold of the mouse. One bound, and the country mouse found herself in the hole with the town mouse. From there a passage led out into the snow, and you be sure the country mouse did not wait long before she set out homeward. "'And this is what you call living at ease and being well off,' she said to the town mouse. "'Heaven preserve me from having such a fine place and such a master. "'Why, I only just got away with my life.'" End of chapter 81